Dear friends, welcome on Alatra TV. Today we have two very special guests, independent researchers Raz and Christian. And my co-hosts today are Anastasia and Jason. And we will be talking about ancient connections and megalithic structures. And um, we for sure will have a very, very interesting conversation. Guys, um, would you like to introduce yourself, uh, Christian? Thank you so much um, for your introduction. Uh, my name is Christian. Um, I'm an Italian uh, 29 year old uh, um, philosopher, if you would like. I'm graduated in uh, philosophy and um, I'm specialized in ancient cultures. Um, throughout the years, I went um, through all of the mythological and sacred texts, uh, almost every one of them each and every one of them and um i was able to rec to recognize um a pattern you know mm, several several um common elements between ancient cultures um i guess that this uh common elements ultimately reflect on the um, structures unexplained structures that we see throughout the world you know and um I guess, like many other researchers have already said, um, that this might be connected. Uh, therefore, I started uh, the Ancient Connection project, uh, and I'm in the process of building uh, an online comprehensive uh, blog with all the megalithic sites in the world, the ancient rock art in the world, and all the ancient sacred texts and mythologies uh, available to um, highlight their connections and their common elements. So that's my ancient connection project. Awesome. And Raz, uh, can you also uh, say uh, several words about what you are doing and uh, what are your main points of interest? Yeah, sure thing. First of all, uh, thanks for, for having us. And hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Raz. I'm a Romanian-based uh, independent researcher. I'm also a freelancer and adventurer. Um, to start off, uh, in 2015 uh, is when my journey began. So uh, this is when uh, it was the catalyst point that uh, started my, jo uh, my journey of uh, researching ancient sites. And um, from this moment onward, uh, there were a series of synchronicities that got me to a very interesting point in life where I, I got to meet with a lot of researchers. I got to uh, broaden my perspective. I got to um, get out of the of the metric system, of the dogmatic system that we are being uh, taught in school. And um, like on fast forward, I, I started the project called Archaic Knowledge. Um, it came to life in 2016, but uh, it expanded uh, in uh, 2000, starting with 2018, and uh, it's based on um, uh, the project aims at connecting researchers and at indexing uh, data that's um, officially and unofficially available. So um, I'm trying to create a, a forum for people to um, engage and to discuss um, all the official and unofficial uh, data that we have uh, available at this point. Um, the main point of interest is the uh, ancient connection, the very ancient connection from remote times that uh, mainstream um, scholars are uh, denying, at least for now. Um, and yeah, pretty, mu pretty much uh, my aim is to... Um, spread as much awareness as possible to people to encourage them to uh, research on their own to, to have a critical mindset to raise questions and to learn together now also um, i'm also like connecting researchers from various fields with whom i'm like keeping in touch and i'm trying to bring them all uh, together to a place where we can uh, learn and expand our uh, worldview. 
Yeah, thank you very much for introduction. And that's really fascinating topic to all of us and to guys from Alatra. And just, I have a question. Essentially, if we talk about this um, archaic knowledge or ancient connections, this information, which is in the field about alternative history, how we can say, and this information essentially was kind of taboo 10 years ago. And how do you think how that happened that now it's almost becoming a mainstream? Well, um, my guess is that uh, eventually um, the event of the internet and social media allowed us to, um, to reach uh, many more people than it was uh, 10 years ago. Um, some researchers, such as um, Graham Hancock, um, are writing books about these topics um, for at least, you know, 20, uh, 20 years, is my guess. Um, however, they remained, you know, a lot, um, like, not so mainstream, you know. Today, with the advent of social media, this, uh, this knowledge um, can be accessible to many more people. And uh, several, several pictures um, of the megalithic sites that we, that we talk about are far more accessible to each and every one, you know, because uh, these are topics that um, go very well with uh, eye evidence, you know, because uh, there are a lot of megalithic sites that just by seeing them, you would say this is impossible that, uh, you know, a um, primitive uh, raw um, group of, uh, you know, ant gatherers or uh, agricultural people would, would be able to build, you know, yeah, which is sure. which is the um, the message the mainstream history wants to wants us to believe you know so yeah ultimately i think that uh you know this understanding will uh, will be accessible to many more people today with the internet and social media and uh you know just to present the argumentation and the logical and the scientific research behind this would be easier to present on social media because uh, you know there was a time when academic environment was closed, and these theories were, weren't even discussed. You know, whereas today, uh, fortunately, um, some scholar and some academics uh, too are slowly opening to these speculations and these theories. Yeah, totally agree. And I think you're both doing a really great job on presenting this image evidence of Thank the you. true history. And I think for me, it was really interesting to hang on your Instagram pages. And that's really fascinating comparison you're bringing there to your, uh, to your viewers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Guys, before we, before we dive right in, why don't you share with our audience and uh, the people that we're all going to share this with, how you two started collaborating together and why you encourage people to work together towards this truth. Please. Okay, yeah. Um, so um, we basically, like uh, Christian was uh, saying earlier, like uh, social me media, it's um, bridging people. It's creating bridges for, for people to reach out to, to one another and, uh, you know, people who uh, are like-minded and who are, like, sharing the common interests. <clears throat> so, um, basically, how we met as uh, Christian reached, reached out to me at, at some point, uh, telling me about uh, the megaliths and the mysteries that um, Italy has to offer. And I was uh, uh, really surprised to see... Uh, some of the things that I, I've missed over the time because the, um, there are just uh, there's just so many things to see and uh, from here on out we uh, we decided I mean we realized that we have a common goal which is to um, spread as much awareness and to build a comprehensive database of um, not only pictures but also um, 
um, articles and uh, why not uh, videos. So um, this is how our journey started. We started like uh, collaborating on uh, different uh, projects that are in, uh, in the works right now. They're about to be finalized soon. And um, yeah, this is, this is pretty much how we, we started uh, working together because we, were, uh, we had this uh, common interest and we, we found that we had a lot to talk about, a lot of things to, to discuss because we were both independent researchers and have a lot of insight to, to share. And it was really engaging. Uh, talking to Christian and all this time, like we, we've met like, um, I think about one year ago, uh, we started uh, working together and it was really, a really mind expanding uh, uh, journey until now. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's great, you know, that you are sharing this because in today's world, uh, we most often see that people like try to, uh, uh, do things for themselves only, but uh, from uh, what we can understand, it is the uh, this thirst for knowledge to find the truth that uh, brought you together, and uh, this is also what motivates us uh, to do all the kaleidoscope effects to bring back truth to people. Uh, so it's great uh, to have you here, and uh, I hope uh, we can uh, uh, jump uh, to the questions. All right, Jason. Yeah, thank you guys so much. So this question is for Roz. <clears throat> um, I would like, can you share the, your information that you have about the coffins in uh, Japan and uh, discuss with us a little bit before we get in depth on that topic, what they are, uh, what you have found and how old they are? Uh, yeah, sure thing. Yeah, this is a really interesting uh, topic. So um uh, on Archaic Knowledge, I'm presenting a lot of evidence of uh, ancient connections, some from remote times that we don't know much about because there's been much uh, erosion and so many events, be it natural, artificial, that uh, uh, destroyed like all the evidence. And um, a very interesting uh, topic of discussion is uh, this uh, keyhole connection. I think, I believe uh, some of you have heard of this um, keyhole connection. It's actually an ancient primeval symbol that's been used by cultures uh, throughout history, uh, apparently with no connection between them. And um, this keyhole connection to, to start off, it became a national symbol for, for the Japanese people. Uh, so they were really, really proud of this keyhole symbol. They, they, uh, they basically have kofuns. So uh, kofun literally means uh, tumulus. It's, a, it's like a burial mound. And uh, they have over 160,000 kofuns uh, in Japan. Uh, some of them bear like common uh, geometrical shapes like uh, triangles or uh, circles, but most of them, and the most important of them, uh, look just like a uh, keyhole symbol or a wedge and dome. Uh, they are wedge and dome shaped. Um, and uh, like the, the Royal Kofun uh, is uh, built like this, is surrounded by a moth. It's really, it's really huge Kofun. Uh, in Japan and yeah for a long while I mean they have this in all, all the regions and all the archipelago uh, including on some of the remote islands they have these kofuns and they, they they said well this is just our national symbol like our ancestors starting with the mid third century to the late sixth uh, sixth century um, they were burying the dead inside the keyhole shape and it's our symbol but then in 2004 um, a Korean guy came uh, who finished uh, had a PhD uh, in ancient history at Harvard and um, he uh, came across um, similar if not identical uh, key-shaped kofuns in uh, on the peninsula of uh, Korea 
which until then in antiquity, in antiquity it was believed they, they never communicated, but they, um, they found this there as well. Uh, and they started debating about that. Right now, if you're looking on the internet about the Korean Kofuns, you won't find much. Uh, so the information is still being uh, suppressed, but you can find this guy uh, on Vimeo, if you're searching on uh, Vimeo, uh, the, about the Korean Kofuns, you're going to find some relevant uh, information. So it's in uh, South Korea. Um, it's identical to the to Kofuns in uh, Japan, and it's believed to have been built mid uh, 5th to 6th century AD. So right in the in the period when uh, the Japanese had them, so this is when an entire string of connections uh, start because this is like those are not the only places where the keyhole symbol uh, is found the kofun. So um, you can find them literally on uh, every continent. Like some of the oldest ones are in um, North America. So uh, if you've heard of the mound builders. They had something uh, key shaped like uh, near Lake uh, Lake Michigan, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, they had this there, and um, they have this in Italy as well. This is a really interesting connection because I th I, I think that uh, the Japanese people, the ancient Japanese people, uh, could travel on the coastline uh, all the way to Italy from uh, from Japan. So they have they have actually. So many uh, nuragic sites that are shaped like keyhole, just like a uh, Japanese kofun in Italy. Uh, the most famous of them is the well of Santa, uh, the uh, nuragie of Santa Cristina. Um, and they have a few more there as well. And then if you, um, yeah, I also want to mention that the interior is very similar and I'm gonna showcase that as well that the interior of those kofuns in Japan are identical with the ones in Italy the corridors the shapes the entrances how the the megalithic stones are aligned at the entrance and uh, yeah moving forward uh, with the help of Google Earth they uh, discovered the keyhole symbol like the identical keyhole symbol in um, uh, Saudi Arabia so they went there with Google Earth, and then in 2009, some researcher came. Researchers uh, went there by uh, helicopter and took some uh, photos of them and tried to um, date them. Um, of course, there's been some debate with the datings, but they're 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 thought to be over uh, 5,000 years old, like uh, between uh, 4,000 and 1,000 BC. They've been dated. Uh, there are many in Saudi Arabia. It's very interesting uh, to note that this can also be related to the other formations that are also found in Jordan and in Saudi Arabia called the, the kites. If you've seen the kites called the, bu the bullseyes, the bull eyes, there's an entire debate on this as well, but pretty much they've been used, I think, from what I've researched, they've been used by um, uh, nomadic uh, people of the area for uh, gathering herds of antelopes, for uh, keeping like keeping keeping the animals inside. But this is just this is just a theory. And I don't want to deviate from the subject. I want to move uh, forward with this keyhole symbol. So um, it's actually present in England as well. Uh, in the form of step wells. So the, the, the keyhole symbol, you find the holy well in Yorkshire, England. Uh, there are also uh, symbols like this in uh, Scotland, very old, like Neolithic, uh, uh, from Neolithic times. Uh, you also find one in uh, New Mexico, USA, I find the um, petroglyph that looks exactly like this one and just like the one in Scotland. And uh, then you find in Egypt, like uh, in Aswan, Egypt, you'll find a step well in the form of a, a dome and wedge. 
just like the like the keyhole symbol. You find the one in Maharashtra, India as well. So um, yeah, I don't know if I've missed any, but what I want to mention is that this symbol has been prevalent throughout time uh, because it's it's a primeval symbol. It's been used by by cultures like really old, uh, re really long time ago, and it's been used. Uh, nowadays as well, because the, from what I've researched, the uh, well, the step well in Maharashtra, India, and there are several, uh, they've been built pretty recently, like 2001. There's one, uh, uh, one step, one keyhole symbol in Brazil that's been built by an artist in 2009. Uh, the ones in Egypt are, are, are fairly recent as well, but the, the rest are really, really ancient. So this is like the, the, the symbol had continuity. We're gonna, I tried to understand what it means and why it was so important to all these people. But what, what really amazed me about this topic, like besides that you find the keyhole symbol on every continent and it, it can be a step well, it can be a resting place, it can have some other function. But what amazed me the most is that you find a similar key sh keyhole shape uh, dome on Mars, right on the red planet. And this has been documented in the space journal for some time. Um, if you give wow. me a second, I'm gonna... Yeah, okay, so it was uh, photographed first in 2000, uh, 2007 but by the Mars Odyssey. And later in 2011, by the next uh, orbiter, high rise, uh, and they send the pictures, they look identical. And there's this huge, huge key shaped wedge and dome shaped uh, formation, uh, identical to the ones in Japan. It's the, like, this is like, it has uh, really defined symmetrical features. It's like, a, it has a trapezoidal feature. Um, and uh, it's found in the Libya Montes region uh, where uh, researchers determined like this is a highland region and there's been a lot of erosion from water that poured over the, the lowlands. So um, somehow this uh, structure uh, preserved its symmetry, uh, having all this water uh, uh, pouring uh, around it. So, um, the formation is approximately uh, 2.7 meters in length. So that's almost three kilometers in length. It's one kilometer wide. And the, the dome, the dome, it's about uh, 700 meters. I'm sorry, I cannot uh, convert this in, uh, in the American, meter, uh, in American uh, system right now. Um, and yeah, from what researchers determined, uh, this could be an artificial uh, structure on the surface of Mars. It, it, it wouldn't be the, the first one because we have a lot of anomalies on Mars. We have the Inca city on Mars. We have the, the, the Pentagon shaped pyramid with uh, five uh, sides. We have the face on Mars. We have like the, the rest of the pyramids. Uh, they're like structures that resemble pyramids. We don't know for sure what they are, but they're just so many connections on the red planet uh, that match the formations that we have on earth and that we know are artificial. Yeah, so uh, this was pretty intriguing uh, that we have all these connections, but the real question is what does it mean? What, where did the ancients get the inspiration for, for all this? And I came down to the symbol, to the Hindu symbol, because like Hinduism goes, so further back in uh, time. And I found the lingam. I found the lingam, which is the exact expression, like a 2D uh, expression of the keyhole symbol, uh, but not actually not the lingam, the, the yoni. Okay, so we have like the lingam is a, a mixture of, uh, it's a representation of Shiva and it's a, a mixture between feminine and masculine forces. But if you take if you take out the the lingam, you only remain with the with the yoni, the the feminine force. You'll have the exact 
uh, domain wedge uh, shape there. It actually represents, so um, it represents the womb. The womb and this shape of the womb is an ancient symbol we find in the Neolithic times uh, as well as recent, uh, more recent times. It's a symbol of um, uh, rejuvenation. It's a symbol of rebirth. So uh, we know that many of these ancient cultures believed in reincarnation. Uh, death for them wasn't uh, something that you, you only live once, stuff like this. So we, we, got the, we got the womb, we have the symbol. It only makes sense to have uh, their leaders, to have somebody uh, buried inside the womb to um, ascend, like to, to go to, to the next life. And uh, uh, so uh, then I also went to Egypt because there's also this interesting uh, symbol there, the Ankh. Everybody's familiar with the Ankh. It also resembles this uh, keyhole feature and it's very interesting. What I, what I noticed here, you see the Ankh, this, like besides uh, his uh, shape has, it looks like a cross and has uh, two little, two arms, two side arms. And uh, these stand for the Ka, the Ka, which is the soul in Egyptian mythology. So it comes with a knot it, it comes with the knot in the middle. So basically the, the ka, the soul embraces the symbol, the keyhole symbol. So we can go, we can go here further with our understanding of what this means. So the ankh is the key of life. Um, nobody actually knows what it means because it's so ancient, but there's been like, a, there, there's been a lot of interpretation. And we know like the sidearm stands for the ankh for the for the soul and basically it, what it does that the soul embraced the symbol meaning it's a symbol of life of somebody who is alive taking taking the car away keep taking the little arms away would only leave the keyhole symbol a symbol of um, rejuvenation without the soul it would leave the symbol with without the soul so it for me directly link links it to um, somebody who enters the, the next cycle of life, who, uh, somebody whose soul uh, departed. So um, this is where my, my research stopped uh, regarding this. Uh, I would like to, I will have a comprehensive uh, article soon, like detailing uh, everything but it's really fascinating to find this ancient symbol connected to all these cultures and so many parts of the world and to also have like hinduism connected with uh, the ancient egyptians because this is really important i also believe that both of these cultures influenced each other in the in the distant past uh, to make only one remark before leave, uh, letting Christian say something about his topics. Uh, we have the Radnajiri area in India, uh, which has been dated to uh, 10,000 uh, BC, something like this, where we have a lot of interesting symbols, including the, the winged scarab wearing the, the sun disk. So mm -hmm. I always thought, I always believed that the, the scarab and the sun disk is a native Egyptian symbol. But then I, I discovered that there's one that's 12,000 years old in India, in the Radnajiri area. Of course, they also have the, the master of animals, that primeval symbol that permeated all the cultures to this day. But I'm only talking about the, now about the connection between Hinduism and uh, Egypt, uh, Egyptian culture without going further into details. Just wanted to, to point this out and uh, I, I'll stop with my topic here. So if you have any, well, any more questions for me, you can. Uh... You know, it's 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 fascinating, and um, you know the thing that uh, you have uh, also find connections between uh, Earth and Mars is very interesting because uh, we uh, did also a kaleidoscope of facts um, where we um, on paleo contact where and on pyramids that we did the connection between also uh, Earth and Mars. And uh, there's a lot of similar things and uh, maybe also uh, 
heard the similarities between uh, the Tolos on Mars and the Silbury Hill in Avebury in, uh, in Great Britain. And um, I mean, this adds to this, uh, <laughs> to the plethora of uh, connections between the two planets too. And this is really, really interesting. And, you know, for uh, in regards with Kofuns, it's um, before uh, meeting you guys, I didn't know about them. And uh, we talked uh, with Jason uh, yesterday that uh, this is crazy. I mean, these things are huge. And uh, like, you even today, it would take a lot of time and effort to build such things. And as we know, uh, whatever uh, like the um, mainstream science doesn't know or doesn't want us to know, they call uh, these uh, tombs that someone is buried inside when we know that uh, pyramids uh, like did not <laughs> at any point in time uh, had uh, someone buried in them. And this is uh, very, very uh, interesting to find all these connections. And thank you guys for bringing um, and new pieces of knowledge to uh, on the table. Thank you. You're, you're most welcome. And one more remark, it's uh, like uh, uh, regarding the Kofuns, it's very interesting that uh, the written history of uh, Japan started uh, in the third century AD. So it's basically a really recent history. So um, the Kofuns were, were there when the history of Japan started. So we don't know much about them, just that they buried their uh, rulers, they, their emperors inside the, the kofuns, like uh, inside the, the dome-shaped uh, chamber. Uh, and we don't know, maybe, and I'm pretty sure those kofuns uh, dated back to, a, to an earlier period in, in Japan's history that we, don't, we know nothing about. And maybe there were, deemed as sacred by, by the Japanese rulers. That's why they want to be buried inside these. So maybe there were just, uh, the coffins were there from, um, were built by previous civilizations and then the, the, new, the new generations uh, in Japan came and uh, uh, inherited them actually from these people. Yeah, that's, I think that's really fascinating topic. And like the thing is that we kind of was trying to map where are pyramids located. And I think so many researchers are doing this thing nowadays, but seriously speaking about cocoons, it's not really so much discussed, but it seems to be, it is similar network existing. And we know that the ancient people would not do anything without reason. And like our research, like on pyramids showing that they were placed at very special energetic places like special locations based on the ley lines. And uh, we were talking with one of the researchers uh, who, who is really like using these ancient methods and she's combining them with physical studies and she's proven that there are these energies and it would be really interesting to do this kind of research on cocoons. So, and that's, thanks a lot for bringing that topic. And I think it really, uh, my question is always when we talk about these ancient structures, and it seems to be they are not really fit into the, like this history, which we are taught. How do you think, how old is this, our humanity? How far our history as a humans goes, go, how many thousand years ago we could say based on your research? Um, yeah, this is a really tricky question because I, I can just say some dates. I can just uh, there uh, to the to the biblical dates, but for me it's really tricky uh, because I don't know uh, for how much our history actually stretches. Um, I know it uh, it goes like a roller coaster. Like humanity, the the time of humanity is just like a roller coaster. It has its ups and downs, and sometimes it, it gets this gets destroyed and then we build everything up and now we have like a, a pretty good landmark we have the, the younger dryas uh, period uh, which happened like 12,000 years ago but I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure uh, civilization mother civilization existed uh, before that time like uh, the best proof the best mainstream proof is um, the city of uh, the ruins of um, Gobekli Tepe so uh, yeah, we, we I think we're going 
we can stretch thousands upon thousands of years. If we if we look at uh, Hinduism, so at the Hindu mythology, it's considered mythology. Although I, I found so many similarities with uh, our um, Western uh, and Eastern uh, texts and dates. Uh, like if we take the story of uh, Krishna that uh, reincarnated over 10, 10 times, humanity, like modern humans, humans with, with advanced capabilities uh, could stretch back at least 5,000 years. So as much of this history is covered, what remains are the primeval symbols uh, that thrive through all this time. Like, like you have the Alatra symbol is one of the primeval symbols as well as the Ankh and a lot of other symbols. So um, there's been a transfer of uh, information from those remote times that have been wiped, have been wiped out by uh, ca uh, cataclysms, be it natural or artificial, as we're about to see. So I, I cannot, I cannot put a date on. Uh, a history of uh, humanity, of modern humans. I, I don't really know. It's just yeah. mind-boggling. Yeah, thank you, Russ. But I know that Christian, uh, his speciality dealt with this issue with dating the prehistoric size, and I think you have a lot to add, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, mainly because um, one of the major flaws of modern archaeology is dating the sites because um you know i think we um, rely uh, we can we cannot really blame uh, archaeology for give um, because they may have given um wrong datings to the sites because they what they do is actually a scientific um, process to um, to date a site which is uh, to find the remains of the of the inhabitants of of those who've settled in such site, you know, and date their organic remains with the C fourteen carbon dating, right? And uh, so far, it it is the only uh, way we have to have some datings, you know, some hard data for uh, to to catalogate a specific site. However, uh, like Rad said, with, uh, with the example of uh, the Kofuns, um, there has been several cases uh, in which um, later civilization discovered pre-existing sites and settled and uh, inhabited those, uh, those areas, you know, and utilized pre-existing structures to um, to build their own uh, um, places of warships, if we may call uh, if we may call them like this, you know, like temples or like uh, points of interest. Uh, one of the one of the best examples would be would be the ones in Japan, you know, because we uh, we know that Japan history uh, is uh, pretty more recent, pretty much recent. You know, uh, documented history. But what we don't know is who left the megalithic buildings in Japan, um, because we can find that uh, the most important buildings and structures in the medieval uh, period, like the Edo period of Japan, were built upon polygonal megalithic uh, masonry, uh, you know, structures like the Osaka castles, the, the Uwajima castle, they, they were placed on top of uh, a megalithic um, polygonal masonry base and foundation because they knew that those walls uh, withstood the test of time. Since Japan is uh, an earthquake, uh, particularly a uh, er strong earthquake, earthquake area, uh they probably knew that those walls uh would stand the test of time and earthquakes you know as several other megalithic polygonal walls in all the world in all the mediterranean area and uh, in south america uh, as well we can find this megalithic polygonal masonry uh that 
is built with, uh, you know, uh, with anti-seismic properties in mind, right? Uh, several researchers, especially Japanese ones, uh, have done this kind of tests. And uh, it shows um, some tests were conducted at the Oka Castle, actually, uh, which is surrounded by megalithic uh, polygonal masonry. They found that in case of earthquake, these stones are able to move almost uh, freely, but uh, without falling apart, you know, without remaining in place. Wow, that's very interesting. I never yes. heard of it. Wow. So that uh -huh. would be uh, that would be um, a really strong anti seismic way to build some walls, and that would be also the explanation why uh, several of these uh, megalithic structures actually came to us, even though they might have been built before the age of cataclysms and all that stuff that happened in the Younger Dryas period, which is. Uh, focal point of our discussion because um, that is what ultimately is being uh, confirmed by official science, which is that these cataclysms actually happened and they happen worldwide. And they probably, uh, if they happen today, they would wipe us uh, away, you know? Since we don't have those kind of uh, anti-seismic structures, in a certain way, like megalithic, uh, really huge structures. Um, I guess uh, from you know five thousand years from now, uh, there would there you know there would be uh, very um, few evidence of our existence. You know, which is mainly what uh, Plato says in his uh, in his book uh, The Critia when he's when he talks about Atlantis. You know. He says that ultimately the survivors were the ones that inhabited the, the top of the mountains and all that stuff. And um, all those uh, histories and accounts of the times before uh, the cataclysm were uh, conserved only by those peoples. And then they became uh, like a um, mythological narrative through the centuries and the millennia. You know, but Plato and the ancient Egyptians, because in the Krisha we know that um, the, the main source from this story is uh, an ancient Egyptian priest, uh, they firmly believed that uh, those mythological accounts had a true background in uh, remote history. And uh, let's say, you know, to give a date like Plato did, which uh, confirms the younger Drias hypothesis, and this is the most fascinating thing to me. Uh, he says that those events happened uh, roughly 9,000 uh, here before uh, his time, which is pretty much correct with the younger Drias hypothesis uh, happening like uh, 11,000 years ago, you know? And uh, yeah, to... to to connect with what uh, Rads was saying about the, the sacred wells, because uh, the Kofun might, might be regarded as sacred wells too. There, uh, there's one in Italy, and like Rad said, the Santa Cristina well, which is uh, unlike any other Sardinian structure that we have uh, in Italy. That is why uh, I think that that particular structure is um, um, it predates the Noragic civilization, you know, because of uh, it. It's shaped like a keyhole, of course, but the proportions are incredibly flawless, and uh, the astronomical uh, knowledge that uh, was required to build that particular structure is uh, mind-boggling, because. Um, at each and every uh, solstice, solstice and equinox, if you stand uh, in front of the steps of the well, you would see your uh, shadow cast upward, upwards on the back of the wall, you know, like in a descending position. And that, and that connects to the mythology of the descending of the gods, 
which we find extensively through the Sardinian pre-neuragic history. Um, also, uh, on top of the well, there is a little hole, which uh, ancient uh, archaeologists believed that it had no meaning, but um, modern research has shown that every 18.6 uh, years, so every 18 and a half years, the moon reflects exactly inside that hole, creating, uh, you know, at the full moon reflects precisely into that hole, creating uh, inside the, the well, if, it, if it's filled with water, there will be the perfect round image of the moon. You know, it feels, it completely fills all of the well. So um, I guess it was also used as an astronomical and uh, um, event tracker, you know, and also to track the passing of time and of seasons. And I feel that this knowledge was uh, not uh, shared by the, the actual neuragic civilization, you know? So uh, it, it really might be that this site was uh, really uh, much older than we believe, as well as uh, many other astronomical or oriented sites in Italy. You know, that, that there's uh, more that, than 200 uh, astronomical aligned site megalithic structures only in central Italy, which is uh, near me, you know? And uh, this is completely fascinating. Uh, also because um, researchers such as Dr. Roberto Mortari, which is an Italian geologist, he has conducted several researches on the uh, whole of the megalith true megalithic polygonal masonry uh, of the Mediterranean area. And uh, he, what he found is incredibly fascinating because um, he has he measured some of the um, best preserved uh, stones and walls. And what he has found is that um, these have uh, completely different metric systems than the, the actual Etruscans, Roman and Greek walls, you know? Uh, because the Etruscans had a metric system of 1.68 uh, centimeters and multiples of that number, the Romans 1.85 um, and the Greeks 1.93, which are the, um, the Greek dactylos and the Roman digit, you know, they, they are called in uh, mainstream archaeology. Whereas the true polygonal masonry is completely different it has 1.536 centimeters precise and the multiples of this number repeated in each uh, single stone that form the walls. And the multiples, uh, the angles of the stones are multiples of 1.5 degrees, which mm -hmm. is again, completely different from the Roman, Greeks, and Etruscan measures. And let me be specific because uh, all of these three civilizations respected precisely, especially the Romans and the Greeks, precisely respected those metric systems. Therefore, it cannot be that these walls were built by the Romans, uh, the Greeks, and not even the Etruscans, which are way older than the, than the Romans. Therefore, who built these walls? You know, that's the, that's the real question. Uh, the answer might be that the Pelasgic civilization might have been the builders of these walls. The Pelasgic civilization uh, is a mysterious, enigmatic, civiliz lost civilization. Uh, the, the mysterious part, the really mysterious part, is that they were already lost in time at the times of Hesiod, at the times of Homer, at the times of the most ancient historians, like Herodotus, like uh, Strabo, um, like Thucydides, they all speak, spoke about this civilization. Uh, Homer, in particular, and Hesiod, uh, they told uh, they told us through their their written records um, that they didn't know 
They didn't know uh, where they came from, what was their origin, nor where they went. They didn't know anything about them. And we are talking about already ancient historians, right? And um, therefore, we can only rely on their testimony. And their testimony, uh, Italian ancient historians included, like Strabo, they firmly believed that they were the first inhabitants of Italy, where the, this pelagic civilization. Uh, do you know they, how far? Sorry, do you know how far they were uh, at that? Like, was it um, several thousand years ago before this younger Dryas cataclysm, or was it after cataclysm? Well, we actually uh, don't have this kind of precisely this kind of information. I guess the Pelasgic civilization, civilization came afterwards, the Cataclysm, uh, because the, um, these sites were dated to, um, I mean, they cannot be precisely dated, let me be specific, but uh, we know for a fact that some of the megalithic polygonal walls, like the ones that are built on uh, the beaches of uh, Orbetello in Tuscany, and uh, in the Lazio region uh, here in Italy, uh, they were built uh, before 5000 BC, 4000, 5000 BC, because we found uh, like uh, sea uh, mar uh, marine, uh, you know, sea organisms embedded in them, the sea uh, organisms traces like mollusks and uh, all of this stuff embedded in the walls. And uh, the sea levels, uh, with, the, with the aid of Dr. Roberto Mortari, which conducted the, this uh, kind of research, uh, the sea levels uh, were lower than that before 4,000, 5,000 BC. Therefore, to have this kind of erosion and uh, contact with, uh, with the waters of the sea, they must have been built before. We don't know specific uh, datings because we know that stone is not datable. So, uh, you know, to connect um, with what, what is, was I saying before is that uh, we, uh, we can only rely on uh, organic material that we found in such uh, megalithic sites, but we cannot directly date the stone. So we can uh, know when a civilization came into uh, contact with the site, uh, with the walls, but we uh, don't know who actually built them because we have extens extensive proofs that civilizations tended to do that, which is establishing and settling in pre-existing sites. Therefore, we cannot ultimately date when a stone was quarried, transported, and set into place because we cannot date stone. Uh, because, you know, even if we can, because the stone has organic material embedded into uh, the stone itself, we can always say or argue that uh, such organic uh, remains might have been, uh, you know, placed there later than the actual construction period. Yes, yeah, so therefore, we don't actually know. As far as uh, we can go back in time, uh, one of the oldest sites, uh, which has been like astronomically uh, dated, uh, is the Adams Calendar in South, in South Africa by uh, Dr. Michael Tellinger, which based on the uh, correlation with Orion and the Leo constellation, uh, would give an estimate period if, if, if the actual stones, the three aligned stones, because Adam's calendar is a site where three megaliths are aligned, most likely with Orion, they were aligned with that constellation at least uh, in a period ranging from 75,000 BC to uh, uh, 60,000 BC. Uh, BC, you know, that would be the the oldest astronomical uh, evidence for a site. Other than you know, Gobekli Tepe, which is which 
has now gone viral and mainstream, which is 12,000 uh, uh, years old, making it the oldest site. But there's, uh, you know, there's Tiwanaku too in South America, in Bolivia, which uh, the, the founder, the discoverer of the site, Dr. Artur Poznanski, has dated to uh, 17 uh, and, five, and 500,000 BC because of its astronomical alignments. And uh, this, uh, this fact was always questioned by mainstream archaeologists who didn't believe Arthur Poznanski, although he spent his whole life researching at the site. And today, with modern uh, tools and modern technology, we were able to, uh, to know that there are like 21 meters uh, of uh, layers uh, underground Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, which are the be, uh, between the, the most enigmatic sites in all of South America. And uh, the head of Bolivian uh, research for archaeologists, which is uh, which uh, goes by the name of Osvaldo Rivera, he actually uh, found out this with modern tools that, uh, that there are 21 meters of mud and layers of you know, other remains uh, underground Tiwanaku, which would give a, a correct estimate, you know, uh, about the, the Poznaski the Poznaski datings, because uh, all of that layers of mud would mean that uh, the the site went through a series of cataclysms, a series of inundation by the near Lake Titicaca, and giving estimates with the datings where these events happen would lead to those, you know, remote, very ancient datings about this site, you know, and uh, there would be yet another site which was inhabited by several civilizations throughout the centuries, you know, but that originally goes so much way back in time to when we. Uh, at a mainstream level, we uh, we say that you know nothing should be uh, that that advanced, you know, from back then. So you know, these are uh, rough estimates, you know, that could be given if we approach these uh, these megalithic sites with a logical and uh, uh, rational mind. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You, you've actually covered such a vast <laughs> amount of information uh, that it would take quite some time to pick apart for most people. So thank you for sharing that with us. Raz, maybe you uh, would like to add on to uh, what Christian was talking about before we move on to uh, uh, the question about the Assyrian structure and the settlement underneath it. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So um, Christian is right with... Um, all the ancient civilizations that uh, that paid utmost attention to the astronomical alignments and uh, to the to the position to the positioning of the ancient structures, like in the case of the wells, like the the keyhole shaped wells, most of them are directed with the dome towards towards sunset. So. Uh, there was always like this kind of knowledge that right now um, in modern times we are missing. Um, and um, yeah, uh, as I said, like uh, Christian covered a lot. I could go like, I could go in depth here as well. And I don't, I don't think it's, it would be a good idea to do so like uh, covering some, some more connections between uh, those cultures, like Asian cultures, Hindu cultures, and uh, Central and South American ones. Uh, yeah, let's just go over a few things, you know, because uh, let, let's share with uh, those that are going to watch this, the three current methods that we have for dating things are um, celestial, right? Uh, and uh, we have yep. radiocarbon, and then we yeah, have chemical, chemical composition. Go ahead. 
Yeah, we also have uh, we also have like thermal luminescence. So basically, uh, the dating methods they vary. They're varied because uh, with carbon you can only date like uh, organic materials, and we also need uh, like how, how how can we date like the the petroglyphs? So for for this we have like thermal luminescence, and uh, now with the latest technology. Uh, we, we also have that uh, nuclear-based uh, technique. That I'm yeah, yeah, check, check in for uh, u uranium depletion. Uh, depletion. So. Yeah, checking. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, we need a variety of dating methods because there, are, like, uh, some sites cannot be dated uh, using one or another method. So we we'll, we'll only only needs to uh, only need to diversify. Always. Sorry. Well, thank you so much, Raz.